of Hebrews chapter 12, please. Book of Hebrews chapter 12. And we are nearing the end of this wonderful letter. And I don't know if you, if you're like me, you're already missing and missing it. You're missing it already because you know it's one chapter ahead and I've been ahead a few chapters ahead of you. So um, it's always hard to finish the book because there's so much fun in it. At the same time, it is necessary for us to read the whole letter. It's a letter. So we have to read the whole thing to make sense of it. Uh, so many times Christians just read verses here and there. You know, they, they throw verses at each other and they don't know the full context of where that verse is, what it means, and what the book means. We've been, we've been reading that this letter was written to Jewish believers uh, before 70 AD, so sometime around the year 55 to 65 AD, that uh, were in Jerusalem in the Galilean area. And they were being pushed and forced, and, and, and there was a lot of problems there, and the persecution was heavy starting at that time, that were thinking about going back to the Old Covenant way of living. They were going back to the Old Testament living. Had the fact that Jesus had come already and fulfilled the Old Covenant, there was no need to go back under the law. And so Jesus makes the whole thing different. Jesus makes the whole entire thing different. In fact, he divides time. That's what we call it A.D., the year of our Lord, Anno Donovan, right? Uh, history is divided by his coming. History is divided by his arrival. And history will go by the way when he arrives the second time. And history will change. History has been changed because of Jesus. And so the writer of Hebrews says, if you have Jesus, why are you going back to where you came from? And, and, and for us, it's the same thing. We may not want to go back to Old Testament Judaism. We didn't come from that, but we all came from somewhere. And the, and, and the, and the tension and the problems and the persecution and, and the difficulties of our day would cause us to be tempted to go back, to drop our cross and not follow him anymore. And so that was the trouble with the Hebrews. And so the writer says, let us go on with Jesus. That's the only safe place to be is go on with Jesus in faith. Right? You started with Jesus, you go on with Jesus, you finish with Jesus. Nothing's changed since you got saved. You're just supposed to grow and become more mature. And so the writer of Hebrews tells us, look forward to Jesus. Look forward to Jesus. Don't look to the side. Don't look behind you. Like so many Christians look behind in their past and say, well, I was saved 20 years ago. Don't look back at your past faith. It's not safe. Look forward to Jesus. Look forward to where your faith now takes you. Right? Don't rely on your past faith. It is not wise. It can be dangerous because you think it's have a, you have a false sense of security. Well, 20 years ago, well, where you are now and where are you going forward? That's the critical part. And you've heard me say this before. It's not the faith you start with, but it's the faith that you finish that's important. And the book of Hebrews makes that clear. All of these in chapter 11 died in faith. They died believing that Christ Jesus would come. And, and none of them saw Jesus come. But they believe he did come. They believe he will come. And we believe he did come. We believe that he, Jesus has come. And we believe that Jesus will come again. Well, the Old Testament saints did the same thing. So that's the encouragement. Don't give up on your faith. So chapter 12 tells us, keep your gaze on Jesus. Keep your gaze in Jesus. But he looked upon this. Uh, let's skip a little bit. He looked at the Christian life as a race. Okay, this is chapter 12. Looking unto Jesus, right? And look upon it like you're running a race. And so you're supposed to take everything off that hinders you. That means sin, which is the obvious, and also things that don't help you grow. Things that are not inherently sinful, but don't help you grow. And we talked about a lot of things in there. We talked about a lot of things that are not necessarily sinful things, but habits and hobbies and things that we even like can be a hindrance uh, I, I realized of, um, I talked about, a, well, I didn't talk about this, but I read about believers who had gone into the mission field and they've given up relationships that uh, they were in sinful relationships. It would have been godly relationships, but they had to give them up because they knew those relationships would hinder their calling into the mission field, into what God has called them to do and to be. And, and that's a hard thing, isn't it? Because we would tend to think, well, we just want the satisfaction now. We worry about the other stuff later. And the Christian is to think of what hinders me. What hinders me from running this race? And whatever that is, sin or not a sin, 
We are to strip them off. We're to take them off because the race it is important. It's the, it's the biggest race of your life, and it's to follow Jesus. So keep your eye on the Lord, he says. Keep your eye on Jesus. He ran this race before you. Yes. So keep your eye, just like Jesus, he ran his race, and keep your eye on what he was keeping his eye on. The Bible says in here, uh, let's look at chapter 12 very quickly. Uh, verse 2 it says, fix your eyes on Jesus Christ. He is the author, and he is the finisher of our faith. And what that means is that he went ahead of us. He is the trailblazer. It's the word for author. It, it means somebody who uh, started the race himself. He went ahead of us, like a trailblazer, like a pioneer. Or it could also mean somebody who uh, enlisted you and fired the pistol, as it were, when you're running the race. You ever seen those races? Ready, said, go. He is the author. He begins your race. He puts you in the race. Now he begins the race, and you go. You go, and along the race, he is also the perfecter, it says, the perfecter of our faith. And that's a beautiful word. It means a finisher. I mean a finisher. It means somebody who's run a race himself, but he's also the one who, at the end of the day, will help you finish your race. That's what that word means, a beautiful word. He'll help you finish the race, meaning that as long as you're in the race, you have somebody who will encourage you along the way and will help you continue until the very end, get you to that finish line. That's what Jesus is doing today. He's encouraging us on, and he's helping you finish that race as long as you're in the race. And see, the key part is stay in the race. Don't drop out of the race. That's the book of Hebrews. Don't drop out of the race. Keep going because you're going to have wonderful help. You're going to have divine help. And um, But there are certain things that happen to Jesus. Look what it says here. He has endured the cross. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. He despised the shame. See, Jesus' race, he ran his race, led him through a cross. And there was no way around that road. That road was fixed on the cross. And therefore, he suffered pain, humiliation. But all that shame, it says, he endured it because the joy that was set before him. See, the shame that he suffered was the fact that uh, him being God was rejected. There was a shameful aspect to Jesus' life. Jesus was despised and rejected. But Jesus despised the fact that he was, uh, the, the, the fact that he was being despised. He actually despised that shame that he was being despised, if you can understand that. He did not want that to happen to humanity, but yet humanity despised him, it says. And so... He endured the cross, despising the shame. The shame was the fact that uh, he was humiliated and he was going to be put to shame and he suffered great humiliation at the cross, stark naked on a cross. You know, uh, think of these things, you know, when you, when, you, when you think of the cross, you think of this beautiful picture, you know, this huge cross and it wasn't quite like that. It was rugged. It was a tree with a beam on it and uh, Jesus was stripped of his clothes, put on a cross and and, and, and the people could walk up to him. He wasn't really high up there, as we see in some paintings. It was literally no higher than six feet off the ground. So when you see what happened to Jesus, and you understand that the Pharisees could have walked up to him, spit on his face, called him all kinds of names, and that went on and on for those six hours, you understand the shame, the rejection that he suffered. Yet, he says, he endured it, he despised it, but he endured it because of the joy that was set before him, the future. What was the future? He was going to sit down with the Father. He was going to sit down at the right hand of the throne of God, and therefore he was able to endure such hostility. And so the cross will take us sometimes through difficult things. In fact, um, look what it says in verse 4. You have not resisted to the point of shedding of blood, of striving against sin. You know where our run our race is going to lead us through it's going to lead us through the cross again it's going to be our cross though it's going to be difficult it's going to be trials and hardships but how are we going to overcome it the same way jesus did looking ahead past the shame past the humiliation past the misunderstandings and keeping your focus on jesus even if we suffer and there are christians who suffer christians who suffer death even today christians who are being martyred all throughout the world it's not just our bubble here in America. It's all over the place. And so Paul said, if we suffer with him, we would also reign with him. And see, the glory is what's going to happen after. 
what's going to happen after the suffering, after the difficulties, right? And I would say this, when you become a Christian, you will face difficulties. Make no mistake about it. I'm not here to give you a pat on the back and just say everything's going to be perfect, because it's not. It's not going to be perfect. And the title of this message, just like last week, Why So Many Difficulties? And the reason we have so many difficulties is because God is our Father. Because God is our Father. And therefore, the exhortation in verse 5 is to address you as a son, as a, as a child of God. He says, my son, don't regard lightly the discipline of the Lord. And this is from the book of Proverbs. When trouble comes, you've got to ask yourself, is this God trying to speak to me? Is this God trying to align my life with his will and purpose? And the answer is absolutely yes. If you don't suffer any of these corrections and disciplines, the Bible says here, you're not his. So rejoice in the trouble, in the hardships, and the difficulties that we face. That sounds masochistic. No, it's not masochistic. It's biblical truth. When we endure such difficulties in life, it's because God has brought them into our lives. And what's the purpose of him bringing into our lives? That we become more like him. We become more like him. And so uh, we have trouble in this nation, by the way. Many troubles. One of the troubles is the fact that uh, fathers don't discipline their children at all whatsoever. And I'm talking about fathers, like myself, fathers, right? Uh, a lot of fathers are not home. A lot of fathers don't stay home. A lot of moms raise them by themselves, and they have to do two jobs, and is they're not around. Difficulties, right? The divorce rate and all those things has caused all these problems for kids. So we have a, a harvest that's blooming right now of children that have never been disciplined at all in their lives. And so they think of, they think of what do you mean discipline? What do you mean uh, uh, correction? Well, they've never been and a lot of times, even as Christians, we take that idea, because we maybe weren't corrected or anything like that, we take that idea and we project it onto the Lord, right? And we make an image of God that's not true, and we make an image of God like a grandfather. You know what a grandfather is, right? I guess some of you guys are grandfathers. Grandfathers like having children, but no responsibilities at all. After you're dealing with them for three days, you can send them home, right? That's it. Or you can leave, one of the two, right? Uh, that's, the, that's the advantage, right? But God is not our grandfather. God is not like a grandfather. It actually says God is our father. And grandfathers, they don't have to correct. They just get to enjoy. Right, Russell? You get to enjoy. But at the same time, we project that into our God and say, well, God is like my grandfather. He will never correct me. He just simply gives, 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 and lets me have candy at 9 o'clock at night and ice cream at, you know, for breakfast and... And we project that onto the Lord because they think that's the image of a father to me. <laughs> Boy, that's really, really off, right? The projection of a, God is a true father, a perfect father. And, and it even says here, a true father disciplines, a true father corrects, a true father uh, wants their children to be better than he is. Why? Because he loves them. If he didn't love them, he wouldn't care. You know, have, have more chips, have more of this, have more of that, right? But he cares for them. He loves them. And so... Uh, we have a generation of Christians that, that actually don't see discipline as a good thing, right? That see God as a grandfather. So um, that's another story, and that's for another time. But we have a harvest of that in our day and age. Now, let's continue. When trouble comes, don't resent God. When trouble comes, know that it's from him. When trouble comes, he allowed it. He is the first action in that category. And therefore, he's intended your very best in that trial, in that difficulty. Uh, remember Job. We talked about Job last week. The Lord disciplines those he loves. If you're not his, if you, if you don't get discipline, you are not his. He corrects those whom he loves. And he intends those very things for you. Why? Because it says here, he wants to uh, correct you. And he wants to discipline you. In verse 10, at the end of verse 10, that you, or you and I, we, may share in his holiness. Verse 11, that we would have the peaceful fruit of righteousness. So what are you going to get out of trials and hardships is two things. You're going to be more holy, and you're going to be more righteous. And Christians go, oh, that's it? Why? Because I think as Christians, we want to be happy here and holy later, rather than be holy here and happy later. You will be happy later. But unless you're holy now, you won't be happy later. You need to be holy now. And God's purpose is to bring you into that, into that category of holiness, to make you more like Jesus and, and see the true holiness of Christ. And therefore, 
Trials come. So next time a trial comes, don't go, oh, this is horrible. God, what are you doing? You don't love me. And I says, you love me. And I needed that. And when I was corrected, I, 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 I obeyed your word. In fact, let's go to one verse real quick that stood out to me. Let's go to Psalm 119. The longest psalm in the Bible. We're going to read the whole thing today. Right? Isn't that great? Nobody said amen. All right, well, we won't do it. So Psalm 119. Psalm 119. And let's look at verse 67, right? I should give you the verse because there's so many, so many verses in that. 67. Everybody ready? Okay. Very important. Every Christian should have a Bible. Every Christian should read this verse. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now I keep your word. How do we keep his word? Because I was afflicted. And I understood. I was wandering off the path that the Lord had set up for me. And I was afflicted. God brought affliction, trials, difficulties, whatever it may be. And now I keep your word. When you see a Christian that's real faithful, there's a Christian who has a testimony and a history of God's discipline in their lives. Are you saying that they're sinners? Oh, they might have been, you know, <laughs> at some point in their lives. But it's not necessarily because they sinned that's been disciplined, although that could happen. That, that, that does happen. But the reality is they've been disciplined unto more holiness in their lives. He who, the, he who prunes, the Father prunes, he prunes those who have fruit in those vines. Those vines have fruit, the Father prunes. He gets those big shears and just prunes them away. Why? There's fruit in there. So you can get more fruit, right? Those who produce fruit are going to be pruned back. They're going to be uh, clipped back. And it's going to be afflictions and hardships. So what? So we can get more fruit. And God will be glorified in that fruit. Let's go back to uh, Hebrews chapter 12. Now, all these things should affect one thing, the way you live. And this is the part of the message today. All of this should affect, affect you in the way you live. So in light of everything he says, look at verse 12. Therefore, in light of everything I talked about, I'm going to tell you something. There's some very practical things that you got to do. Strengthen the hands and the weak knees that are feeble. Make path or make straight the path of your feet, so that the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. What does this mean? In light of what I said, all this pain and difficulties that you're going to face, you're going to face some hardships. Even tomorrow, you go to work, you go to school, you have difficulties in your life, you're going to face maybe sharp tongues against you. Because of criticism, you're going to face misunderstanding. You might even face persecution. And this country is not as heavy as other countries. But nonetheless, it is increasing. It has to be this way. And people say, why does it have to be this way? It has to be this way. Why? Because God is your father. And your father loves you. And your father wants you to grow. And so one thing that the writer of Hebrews says is don't give in to discouragement. Look at, look at the language. It's like the running the race again. He goes back to running the race. Your hands that are weak and your knees that are feeble, strengthen them. Don't get discouraged. You're still running. It might be difficult. And it is true. You guys have run, right? You guys are, some of you guys have run marathons and things like that. You want to give up. Your knees are really down. And you're dragging your hands. And you can't run any further. And it's like somebody says, hey, 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 hey. Keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. And those knees that are wobbly, uh-uh, uh-uh. Can't have wobbly knees. You got to keep going. Why? Because God sent you that trouble doesn't mean He doesn't love you. Because God sent you that trouble doesn't mean He wants you to finish. Because God sent you that trouble, it means He wants you to keep running. He wants you to keep going. And all around, right, you see this. You ever seen like marathon runners, right? The city's packed full of them and they're running. And uh, some of them are just like, I can't do this anymore. And some of them just, are just walking. And some of them are laying on the side of the road. Well, not here, not in this race. The only way you lose this race is if you don't finish. The only way you lose this race is if you don't finish. And so don't stop. Keep going. Don't wobble between two opinions, what the prophet Elijah said. How, how often are you going to do that? Right? If the Lord is the Lord, walk with him. If the world is what you want, go for the world. Just know there's consequences. Right? Here's the glory of God. Here's eternal hell. Oh, pastor, don't talk about that. Well, that's the other option. That's what Jesus said to do, right? In fact, he spoke more about it than I ever would because I get all the verses about hell from Jesus. He's the one that spoke about it. So 
Let's, let's listen to him. But if you keep doing his will, right, uh, and you keep walking, no matter the difficulties, you will finish the race, right? So don't limp, right? Don't, don't limp around. Don't mope around. And so don't give in to discouragement. If illness sets in, if hardship set in, right, um, it's, it's hard, no doubt. But don't use it as an excuse to stop running the race. So many Christians, oh, this is wrong in my life. This is wrong in my life. This is wrong in my life. And they go, oh, I don't know if I'm going to make it anymore. I'm not going to go to church anymore. And, I, you know, obviously the only person that's affected is it's, it's you and, and the fellowship, of course. But um, God doesn't love me anymore. Look at all the hardships. Well, um, you're not going to be ruined by this trial that you face. In fact, it'll help you along the race. It'll actually make you a better Christian. Did you know that? It'll make you a better Christian. So it's a reason to continue the race is because he loves you. God sent this. And so you look at trials differently. Verse uh, verse 14, it says, Pursue peace with all men and sanctification, means holiness. Well, without it, no one will see the Lord. The word pursued is the word for sprint. The word for sprint. You ever seen, um, I don't know if you've seen the Olympics or something like that, or races, and you see this group of runners going through first lap, second lap, and everybody's bunched up together. And then right around the final lap, right? And you wonder, like, oh, man, who's going to win this race? Everybody's stuck together. How can anybody win? They're all going to win, it seems like. And you say, well, where's that, where, that, that, that famous runner? And he's just sitting back, and he's, like, in the middle of the pack, and he's going. And you know when he's about to go, he takes off. And he outruns the pack, and he wins the race. That's actually a tactic in running, by the way. You stay with the pack, and as soon as you have that final burst, and you go, that's the word pursuit. Now you get a picture in your mind. Pursue peace. Go after peace in such a way, like a runner finishing that race, because it's an occasion. God's going to use it, an occasion to advance in your life. Pursue peace. The word here, peace, is emphatic in the Greek. I know we don't see it in English, but in the Greek, it's definitely emphatic. The meaning, the, the key thing is peace. Peace and harmony with all men. Now, this is important here for fellowship and ministry, right? A friend of mine used to say, he used to say, I think he still says it, but he says, ministry is easy if it wasn't for the people. <laughs> I think there's a lot of truth to that, isn't that? You laugh because you know it's true, right? You laugh because you know it's true. Ministry would be easy if it wasn't for the people. That includes me too, right? And, um, but how much pain have, has it come into your Christian life through people? Think about that in your life. Has most of your trouble have come from people in, in, in your Christian life? The answer is probably most things, right? It's not just your wife. It's not just your husband, but it's fellowship life. It's church life. It's Christian living, right? It comes from dealing with other people. So what's the, the apostle's encouragement? Pursue peace with them. How can you do that? Well, God sent trouble in your life so that you can actually be more humble to deal with that person that you can't stand. Yeah, I know sometimes Christians can't stand each other. That's true, right? I know because I, I, I give, yeah, give counsel. Don't do that. Don't say that. Don't, you know, talk to him. Talk to her. You know, make sure you're walking in faith. Make sure you're not, you know, sinning against this person. But nonetheless, it's true, isn't it? God sent you this trial in your life to do what? To humble you. Perhaps you can't stand this person because you just lack patience. And you lack patience with people like that. And you just want to go, you know, strangle them. And it could be your wife. It could be your husband. And it could be someone like that, right? Now, especially your spouse. Now, I'll give you a little side view about spouses, right? I've been married for some time, so a little bit of experience, right? So you guys have been married longer than I. You can, you can testify to this, right? God put them in your life many times to deal with your sinful nature that wants to come out. And they're very good at it. For some reason, they're very good at dealing with that, isn't it? So if you have trouble with temper, right? Your wife or your husband will say something or will do something that just, uh, you go zero to 60 in about a minute, about a second, right? And then you blame them for it, right? Like, you made me so mad. And, and of course, you know, the other person, the husband or the wife, are like, you know, we, we're very so godly and holy. We always have the right response, don't we? No, we usually say, what's your fault, right? Well, you do this to me, right? 
And now you have a couple that instead of like dealing with it, encouraging each other, say, you know what, that, 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 that old sinful flesh of mine is still, still there and I need to die to that. And, you know, no, they, they tear each other down. They, they blame each other and they stick down at each other. And it becomes now a three-day journey. <laughs> Three days later, you talk about it again, right? But um, while at the same time, you could have done something about it, right? Pursue peace with the men. And God will bring a trial in your life to do what? To make you more patient toward them. And so your wife and husband brought in by the Lord, especially for you, so that you can love people. And you can love them despite of who they are. And you can love them with no strings attached, even if they don't deserve it. You love them because that's the way God intends for us to love them, right? Love thy neighbor as yourself. The wonderful thing about being married is you get to practice that love with the same person over and over and over again until you get it right. And then if you don't get it right, more trial comes into your life so you get it right. And it's like, God, yes, God is the great pursuer. He pursues you. And he doesn't want to leave you in your whole sinful self. He wants you to grow as a Christian. So you don't want that trial? He'll bring another one. And then another one. And then another one. You're going to love now? Nope, I'm not going to love. Here's another one. Okay, Lord, <laughs> you win. He is the great pursuer. God has perseverance. He's the one that has the perseverance. He pursues us. But you'll become more sympathetic toward others. I know Christians who are impatient, Christians who are sometimes unreasonable. And then trial comes, and guess what? They're much more humble. They're much more meek. They're much more sympathetic. And how are you going to win souls if you've never been through a trial? How can you ever be compassionate for people that have suffered so much? You can never, well, I don't know what's wrong with them, but you're like, I know what it's like to be in depression. I know what it's like to deal with this. I know what it's like that. And you can deal with it. And so you learn to have peace with people through what? Trials. And God uses you even more. So don't resist it. Don't resent it. Embrace the trial, right? This is not a masochistic message, but it's to say, Understand what the trial is doing in you, and you will under, and you you will get through it. You will get through it, and know know that it's going to last for a short time. It's not going to last forever. Sorrow comes in the night, but joy comes in the morning. You're going to be in the glory of Christ if you continue in it. Right? It might be trouble now, but there'll be joy later. Just like Jesus, he endured the cross for the joy that was set before him to be with his Father. Now, one thing the trial does it increases your holiness, and without it. You're not going to see the Lord. In fact, you're going to need holiness to enter the kingdom, so why not strive for it now? Right? Christians don't want to be holy, therefore they're thinking, I'm going to get into the kingdom without holiness. No, you're not. No, you're not. Holiness is not an option in the Christian life. Holiness is not just for the pastor or for the elders or for the more mature ones. It's for every Christian here, from the youngest to the oldest of us. Right? It's not an option. It is a command of the Lord to live a holy and sanctified life. It simply means to be set apart, to shed sin and impurities in our life and pursue it. That's what's called the pursuit of holiness. It's a good book, by the way. Uh, get it. Sell your shirt. Go get it. The pursuit of holiness because it teaches you, as a, especially as men, to lay aside pride, to lay aside all these things, not just for men, but it's written by men. So it comes from that perspective, right? The pursuit of holiness. Are we ever going to be 100% holy? No. Until Christ comes, then it'll be 100% holy. Huh? It's called glorification. But until then, trouble comes and experiences come. So in these painful ones, so I could be more like the Lord. Now, how many times, got to watch my clock. How many times have we had maybe an opinion or maybe thoughts or maybe uh, or even attitudes that just grieve the Holy Spirit? But you didn't know that until that trial magnified it. It put a spotlight into your life and says, you've been thinking like this. And you've been lusting about this. And you've been, you know, your opinion about this was wrong because you didn't see it the way God intended for you to see it. And therefore, these painful experiences and causes our actions and words to be more in line with the Lord. And that's what the psalmist said. You know, I, before I went astray, I was afflicted. Now I keep your word. Now I know what it's like, right? And so these unloving attitudes, we all had them. We've all dealt with them, right? These priorities in our lives, things we love, we shouldn't love. Things we hate, we shouldn't hate. And, and then God brings a trial and then lines us back up. You know, is it, is it I mean, ladies, isn't your, your husband much more humble when he's been dealt with by the Lord, right? No? 
All right? Husbands, isn't uh, your wife a lot more loving and submissive when she's been dealt with by the Lord in some capacity? Absolutely, on both sides of the coin. And he doesn't have favorites. He loves her and loves you the same. And so, now there is one thing Peter said about husbands, though. I don't know if I should go on to this. Uh, 99% of the wives are like, one husband says, I don't want to know. I won't, it won't take too long. One sentence. Read First Peter with your wife. That's an important thing. Read it together. It says, if you, husbands, if you don't uh, dwell with them with understanding, right, and, and live with them, you know, in harmony, you know, and know that they are uh, co-heirs with Christ with you, it says, if you don't dwell with them with understanding, I won't hear your prayers. That's an interesting, isn't it? Now you don't want to get married. Yeah. <laughs> I want God to hear my prayers, but I don't want to do this. You see how, how sometimes we get so cockeyed in our mind? Like, well, I just won't get married then because like, I want God to hear my prayers. Well, that's the point is, if you are married, pursue holiness and godliness and dwell with your wife with understanding and God will hear your prayer. Why don't you take the positive side of it? God will hear your prayers if you do this. Right? That's what it means. Right? Uh, but nonetheless, trouble comes at times where we don't expect it, but it's for the pursuit of holiness, the pursuit of God. So from trouble, we learn to be holy. Amen? From trouble, we learn to be holy. This is amazing. And without holiness, we won't see the Lord. You see the A plus A equals B, B equals C, right? A plus B equals C, right? So uh, trouble and trials equals holiness. And without that, you won't see the Lord. So bring on the trials, Lord! Bring it on! No, not... (laughs) Not masochistic way, man. Yeah? By the way, God, God knows exactly what to give you, so don't even have to ask him for it. But when it happens, guess what? You do what James says. Count it all joy. When they happen, you don't resent. You don't fight back. You don't kick against the goad, as Paul would say, right? Now, final things. To the final part. Verse 15. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many are defiled. That there be no immoral or godless person like Esau, who sold his own birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterwards, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found it no place for repentance, though he did seek it. He sought it with tears." When trouble comes, don't grow discouraged. That's the apostle for the Hebrews is what he's saying. Don't grow discouraged. Uh, Don't have discouragement. It will advance your Christian life if you take trials and hardships the right way. If you know they're from God, if you understand that this is God's pursuit of you, pursuit of holiness, you're going to be able to take these trials and hardships in your life and have a biblical view of it. Have a biblical view of it. Sometimes we don't have a biblical view and we freak out. And we go, oh, that doesn't love me. I don't want to go to church anymore. I don't want to have fellowship with anybody again. Ever, ever, ever. I'm just going to be by myself forever. That's not the right thing to do. That's not the biblical aspect of it. You're running the Christian life. But notice this. I wish I had this slide here. Um, it's not just your race, right? Verse 15. See to it that no one comes short. You're not just running your Christian life on your own. There's a pack around you. Look around you. There's a pack of people here, right? There's a pack of people running the race with you, and the attitude sometimes is, I'm just going to worry about my own race. Huh. I'm just going to worry about my own stuff. I'm just going to worry about my own steps and my own thinking. And it's not like that. It's a cross-country. Anybody run cross-country here? There you go. A couple of you guys, right? And what do you do? Was it a a single run? No. Everybody was together, and you run together. I see them up and down. I don't join them, but I see them up and down my... my, uh, I should... These kids, I don't know how they make it. It's 115 degrees, and they're up and down Millican Avenue. And I go, and I'm thinking, maybe I used to do that. Maybe I thought I was crazy. You know, I think it's crazy, but maybe I was crazy, right? But the thing is, they all run together. They finish together. They start together. They finish together, right? And so one Christian that doesn't finish the race can affect the whole group. One Christian that doesn't finish the race will affect the whole group. And it can affect the race. So you're not running your own private course. I'm sorry to tell you. You don't run a private run. You don't have a private life. You don't have a private thing. Uh, well, I'm not talking about the government watching you or anything like that. But I'm talking about your private run. It's not an isolation. It's not an isolation. Right? You are to consciously keep an eye on each other. This is the key part. You are to consciously keep an eye on each other. Hey, uh, so-and-so slowing down. So-and-so is zigzagging now. 
uh, so-and-so is dragging his legs and his feet and is all wobbly. You know, so-and-so is injured. Quick, get somebody with the gift of helps and get the kindness and get him some help, right? Everyone, be kind to them, right? Um, somebody's injured. Somebody dropped out. Does anybody know what happened to so-and-so, right? Oh, don't worry about it. The pastor's going to do it. The elders will do it. No, actually, did you notice this? Make sure you, congregation, believers, right, that no one is comes short of the grace of God. It's our responsibility as believers to make sure not only your spiritual progress, but other spiritual progress. That's interesting, right? Um, look diligently, it says, that no one's falls short of the grace of God. It's not my responsibility to keep an eye on people. Oh, yes, it is. You know, Cain said that. Wait, am I my brother's keeper? The answer was yes. Yes, you are. But you killed him. All right, wrong Cain. First John chapter 4 tells you more about Cain. He was from the evil one. And the warning is, don't be like Cain. Don't be evil. The idea here is, look diligently to those who have maybe wobbly knees and, and, and are not continued because why? The New Testament is about progress. The New Testament is about progress in your Christian faith. But don't think of yourself as a unit. Think of yourself as a family. That's the Christian view of Christianity. That's the biblical view of Christianity. However, we have thorns and bushes along the way. And look at this one. That no root of bitterness. Thorns and bushes along the way. Now, uh, I don't want to take too much time. And I wish I had a little slide here. But this will, this will make sense. We usually think... Try again. Okay. Usually, uh, we think of bitterness as just an attitude and behavior, stuff like that. And that is true. That is true. But notice how the Bible uses the root of bitterness. And I'll give you one example. Let's turn to Deuteronomy. Let's go back to the Old Testament because this book is, is founded on the Old Testament. Let's go to Deuteronomy 29. Deuteronomy 29. And look at verse 18. And you're going to find something really interesting that God says about bitterness. By the way, the idea of bitterness here has the meaning of a bitter poison, a bitter poison. It's a root of bitter poison. Deuteronomy 29, look at verse 18. What does it say? God's addressing through Moses the congregation, the congregation of Israel. It says, so that there'll be any among you, there will not be any among you, a man or a woman or a family or a tribe whose heart turns away today from the Lord our God to go and serve the gods of the nations, that there will not be among you a root bearing poisonous fruit or wormwood. So what was causing them to fall away from the Lord was idolatry, the idolatry of all the nations. God says, don't go there. Don't follow any other God besides me. That was part of the first commandment, right? And, and the second, because of idols and idolatry, making of idols. And God says to the whole tribe of Israel, to the whole family of Israel, men and women, don't serve those gods of the nations. There will not be among you a root of bitterness, literally a root of poison. That's the word for bitter, a root of poison. It's the same thing that Hebrews 13, I'm, I'm sure Hebrews 13 is rooted in this because it's not just necessarily talking about an attitude like resentment that leads to bitterness. That is part of it too, but something deeper than that, idolatry. Idolatry. The root of bitterness of Hebrews is talking about here is having something in your heart and in your mind greater than God. And what that causes is this root of bitterness in your life that would basically appreciate anybody and anything but God. And that could happen. It's a bitter poison. It's the unfaithful bitter poison. When somebody falls away from the Lord, somebody stops being, un uh, stops being faithful to God, it's a bitter poison. It's a root Notice that is a root. You can't hardly see it. Just like roots on the trees, you can't see it. The surface is just the tree and leaves, right? The trunk and leaves. Underneath, when somebody is in, uh, unfaithful to the Lord, there's a root there, and that root is idolatry. Something they love more than God. Something has come into their lives that they love more than God. And you can say, what kind of sin would that be? It might not even start as a sin. It might just start it as a desire, a lustful thing towards something else or someone else then becomes a, an idol. Now, when rebuking Simon the sorcerer in the book of Acts, I'll, I'll give you the address, you can look at it later, Acts 8.23, Simon the sorcerer was in the church. He was a, a warlock. But he had been baptized, he had come to faith in Christ, and what happens is that he now looked at the power of the Holy Spirit and he said, I want that power for my own gain. 
And look at Peter. Peter says, I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. Why did he use those words? Because he was in the gall of bitterness. He was an idolatrous among the church. Right? Among the church, he was, and Simon the Sorcerer was a bigwig in the ancient times. You just read about it in church history. He was, it's not just in the Bible. He was in other sources as well. So this root of bitterness that is among God's people, God will have to pluck it out. And that's the point of Hebrews 13. Notice how he deals with it. Uh, Acts chapter 5 of, in the book of Acts, God deals with the root of bitterness uh, with Ananias and Sapphira. So I'll leave it for you to read it. Uh, how God deals with the root of bitterness. So when there's evil wickedness in the, in, the, uh, in the assembly, in the congregation. Now, it says here, the root of bitterness, and he gives us an example. You want to see how it looks like so it's not just theory? The apostle's straight up with us. I love this. He says, let that be any immoral, any godless person, there's the idea here of sexually immoral, who sold his birthright for a single meal, and his name was Esau. So think of Esau. Think of somebody that should be in the race, should have been ahead of the race, should have been the most blessed man, one of the most blessed men in the world, Esau, grandson of Abraham. He should have been ahead of the race. The man of, this man Esau was admired by the world. He was a man of the world. He was a big, hairy guy. And he was a hunter. I don't know if you like hairy guys, but you know he was a hairy guy. And he was a hunter. He was admired by the, his dad. Loved him, Isaac. He was his favorite. And what did Esau do? Well, Esau was in line for God's blessing. He was a twin. He was a twin to another man. And when they both came out of the womb, Esau came out first. And his brother grabbed his heel. And he was called Jacob, Jacob, the man who grabs his heel. And Esau was the firstborn. He was in line for the blessing. He should have been the father of Israel, the father of the 12 tribes. He should have been the, 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 the one that headed God's people. He should have been the one that had the blessing of God. Abraham, Isaac, and Esau would have been. He was in line. He was there. He was the oldest. And what did he do? One day he saw a plate of soup. And he said, hmm, that looks good. Lentil soup. I don't know if you like it, but he did. And uh, he faced a choice. He said, I can have what I want now and be satisfied in my carnality, in my flesh, or I can wait and get the blessings of God, which was invisible to him. It was only by promise. Remember, Abraham, Isaac, they just gave the promise. They didn't have it. They just said, God's going to give it to us. And they lived by faith in those promises. So Esau said, huh, bowl of soup or some crazy promise my grandfather made? Mm, bowl of soup. And he did. He went after the bowl of soup. He sold his birthright. He says, I don't need it. I don't want it. I don't care for it. And he was, and you know what? You and I are faced with the same choices. It might be a bowl of soup, lentil soup, and if you like it, but it may be something else. The visible now. Oh, I want that so bad. Oh, I desire that so bad. And God says, wait for the promise. Wait for the promise. Wait for what I have. But it's invisible, God. Yes. By faith, you know what it is. You see it by faith. But I want it now. No, you're not going to have it now. And Esau pursued it, pursued it, pursued it until he chose the flesh over the spirit and he became Esau, a man cursed by God because of his unfaithfulness. And so all the, all the uh, descendants of Esau are now at war with the descendants of Jacob, his brother. It's the trouble in the Middle East and it's going to lead to the return of Christ for sure. But 1 Corinthians 9, Paul tells us that he runs the race. And he says, having preached to others, he says, I, I discipline myself. I discipline my body because I've been preached to others. I don't want to find myself disqualified from the race. And the word there could be translated, translated disqualify. It can be translated reprobate. I don't want to find myself to be a castaway, a reprobate, having preached to others and then drop the race. Like, get out of the race and I'll be disqualified from the race. By stopping, Paul says, I discipline my body. I move forward in the Lord. I know these are hard things, but you know what? I have one pursuit. I forget the things of the past, and I look forward to the things in Christ Jesus, our Lord, the higher calling in Christ Jesus. And that's us for us today. So think of this man. That's what the warning is. Think of this man. He turned his back on the whole blessing. He should have had the whole blessing. He should have been the father of the tribes of Israel. Why didn't he get it? He stopped running. He stopped the race. He said, the visible now is more important than the future promises of God. And he says, but wait, there was a time, though. 
more. There was a time where he thought, what have I done? And he realized what he lost. And it says he wanted it back. Verse 17, he desired to inherit the blessing. He was rejected afterwards because he found no place for repentance, though he sought it with tears. What does that mean? It means he had regret. He had sorrow. He had regret. He had uh, something that he, he regretted. And that's the difference between regret and repent. Regret is just something that, oh, man, the consequences of my choices, now I'm feeling it. These are consequences, right? Remorse, we would say. Remorse, regret. You got caught. Now you're feeling sad, not because it was wrong. You got caught. Now you're feeling with the consequences, right? This is why we teach our children. Difference between regret, you know, are you repentant or are you regretful? Are you remorseful because you're going to get disciplined? Or are you saying, this was wrong and I need to be corrected, right? And, and so you give your kids that opportunity to understand repentance, true repentance. And true repentance means not only a change of mind, but a change of direction. I'm not going this anymore, Dad. I'm not heading that way. I'm heading back to the Lord. Right? It's a wonderful thing to hear from your children, but, but no amount of remorse, notice, no amount of remorse from Esau ever got him to take the promises back. He never brought it back. He never got them back. No amount of tears, beseeching, caring, nothing. Why? He found himself a place where he couldn't repent anymore. He got out of the race, and then he wanted to get back in the race, and it was like, you can't. You can't. You don't, you don't know how to repent anymore. Because all you do is regret. Oh, regret, regret, regret. And people live with regrets. And be careful. It's those who minister the gospel, those who teach and those who minister the gospel, that you find a difference in people's lives. Are they regretful and remorseful? Or is this true repentance? Godly sorrow leads to repentance, the scripture says. And don't kid yourself. This race is not something you jump in and out of. A lot of people say, well, I don't need to run. I'll run next week. I don't need this race. You know, I'll, I'll come back in a year or two years or, you know, oh, yeah, I started the race, but, you know, it's too hard. I'll come back eventually. It's not a race that you just run in and out. It's a race that if you drop out, you may not be able to come back into the race. Why? Because you won't know how to repent because you've rejected it so long that all you find is remorse. And I think you find a lot of people in church that are remorseful not repentful because otherwise their lives would change. Otherwise, Jesus would bring them back into the fold. Absolutely. So what's the point? I'm done. Strengthen feeble arms. Strengthen feeble knees. Make them strong. Look to Jesus. Put everything aside that doesn't help you in your growth as a Christian. As a Christian, Put everything aside that holds you back. Run with endurance. Let's run with race. Uh, let's, let's run with perseverance and patience. Look to Jesus. Look how he endured it. He ran it with joy. He ran it with perseverance. And don't worry about the things that you miss out as a Christian in this life. So much of the Christian looks back and says, well, I could have had that, but I got to follow Jesus. Man, I could have had that, but, you know, I'm a Christian. I can't have that. I can't enjoy that. I can't enjoy it. And, and it's almost like, are you a Christian? Yeah. Don't you want to be one too? No, thanks. I don't want to be that, uh, <laughs> that, 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 uh, that sad about things. But the reality of it is don't worry about those things you miss out. The things ahead are more glorious than you can imagine, right? And the price of glory, the, you, you know, once the price of glory you'll receive, right, uh, you can deal with all the difficulties in your life. Once you know what God has in store for you, if you suffer with them, you will reign with them. Once you know what that is, you'll be like, you know what? I'm not saying bring it on, but if it comes my way, come what may, I'm going to follow Jesus. Come what may, I'm going to finish this race. And you can say, like Paul the Apostle, I'm going to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4 if you want to read it with me, or if you just want to hear me out. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Paul gives his encouragement. God, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. It says, For I am eagerly, being, uh, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and a time of my departure has come. Paul knew this, his race was going to come to an end. And it says, I fought the good fight. Don't you want to say that? I fought the good fight. I have finished the race. You know, all of us are going to say that one day if you stay in the race. I have finished the, the course. I've run the race. I fought the good fight. I've kept the faith. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. That'd be awesome. Right? You kept it. You persevered. You moved on. You didn't let trials and hardships and issues with family and issues with churches and issues with anything kept you from Christ. In the future, this laid out for me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, 
he will award to me, Paul said on that day, not only to me, I love this part, but also to all who loved his appearing. All those who eagerly wait for Jesus Christ will get this crown, this reward. The greatest reward, and I believe what it's saying ultimately, is Christ. The greatest reward is him. For what else do we have that's greater than Christ in this life? And in the next one, who else is greater than Christ? No one. And if you have Christ, you have everything. For us to live is Christ and to die, we're going to gain a lot. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you that you have brought us into your word, into your scriptures, into your holy, holy son. And we ask you, Father, that you help us in this race. Oh, Lord, there's so many toils, snares. There's so many difficulties. There's so many hardships that we may face, Lord. And yet we haven't even faced persecution, the, the, the shedding of blood or the hardships that other Christians face. We haven't faced that here. But yet, Lord God, we know that you are the perfect father who corrects and disciplines his children the right way. Lord, help us to be good fathers. Those who are fathers, I pray for them, Lord. Uh, I ask you for wisdom, Lord, for myself. But also, Lord, I pray that we will not resent and we will not fight against the difficulties that you bring in our lives. For it is working out an eternal weight of glory, a better and holier living, a righteous living. And Lord, I thank you that you did not leave us orphans. You sent us your Holy Spirit. We ask you, Lord, that you send your Holy Spirit upon us and help us to run this race, that our feeble knees will get stronger, that our weak arms and, and droopy hands will get stronger, that we will look to our brother and to our sister and look to see if anyone is falling short of the grace of God. And so, Lord, thank you. We bless you. We love you. We ask you to be with us in our fellowship and our encouragement, Lord. We need, we need encouragement, Lord, not only from you, but from one another. So please, Lord, pour in our hearts, Lord, more encouragement that we'll be able to share with those around us. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.